Okay, so this is a, a double act presentation, as, uh, as Peter has introduced, and that's important on a number of levels, uh, because it's here to demonstrate both what can be achieved uh, with, with new materials and new technology um, within the infrastructure, but it also shows how the supply chain working with network rail in a very integrated way can deliver that somewhat more quickly than has perhaps been the case uh, in the past. So what we're going to cover today um, uh, between us is, um, is how the introduction of a recycled plastic composite railway sleeper um, has been reduced, introduced into the network rail infrastructure to support, support not only sustainability agendas, but, in, but to support uh, the requirements to improve uh, the nature of the infrastructure and to deliver uh, longer life and better value assets. Um, I'll start off a little bit covering the, uh, sort of the introduction of um, the, you know, the reason why Network Rail have been looking at um, uh, new products in this space uh, and to the work that was done to, you know, to get through the, the product acceptance process uh, with the technical authority. Uh, Polly will then take over to, um, to lead on her experience and the work that she and her colleagues from, uh, from uh, Wales and Western have, uh, have done in terms of trialling the product in the track and what they've learned uh, from that, really to sort of prove performance. Uh, because sustainability is all very well, but to, to have a sustainable product, you must first ensure that it does actually work uh, effectively. Um, uh, and then I'll cover a bit about the, the, the carbon um, uh, numbers that we've heard a bit about today, so we see how this really affects uh, the carbon and the embodied carbon in the infrastructure, and a bit about circularity. Uh, and then Polly will come back with that important point on, uh, on, on value uh, and cost in there, because what we want to achieve is a product that is better, performs better, uh, than what we have in the infrastructure, something that reduces carbon, and in the ideal world, it wants to be better value uh, too. So, um, looking first at why uh, Network Rail have been looking at, you know, reviewing the sleeper strategy within the organisation. Well, you've got a, you've got five main points in there. You've, you've got the, the sleeper in the track infrastructure is one of the main components that is limiting longer asset life. Longer asset life a great advantage. Uh, it's also one of the major contributors. Uh, in embodied carbon within the infrastructure, uh, second only really to, uh, to, to the rail steel. But it is a relatively low cost aspect of that infrastructure, being about 12% of a renewal cost uh, through that sleeper. So maybe, maybe we can do something having a major impact uh, on the carbon with a limited impact on the, uh, on the project cost. Uh, and there are other factors. So Creoso ban across uh, Europe on health and safety reasons. Uh, Network Rail was using software sleepers uh, treated with creosote. Uh, and that was going to be banned. Uh, and also, what was the justification for continuing to use tropical hardwood uh, sourced from the Brazilian Amazon rainforest? Um, and you're aware of some of the quotes. That quote comes out of Network Rail's environment sustainability strategy uh, in that piece. And, um, and I know Darren Sharp's in the audience here somewhere, and I've slightly stolen his hamburger and Land Rover Discovery analogy. Um, but uh, concrete sleepers, you know, in a kilometre track, it's a lot of Land Rover Discoveries in terms of carbon footprint and a lot of hamburgers. So really the drive there to reduce hamburgers and reduce uh, uh, land rover discoveries uh, to deliver a better performance. Um, so those are the three things we're going to talk about today. Um, performance um, and how we can prove that the performance of uh, composite sleepers can meet the requirements of network rail and indeed be better than existing uh, technologies and how those can increase asset life. Uh, then we'll look at how we can improve sustainability against those measures we've heard from, uh, from Jane earlier on today. Um, and can they, as well, reduce whole life costs? So indeed, there is no cost uh, to looking at sustainability uh, above uh, performance uh, in that piece. So I'll now hand over to... Um, oh, no, sorry, I'm doing this as well. Um, so, so look a bit about how the first phase of that sort of performance proving happened, and that is, and you'll all be very familiar as suppliers and members of Network Rail in, in this piece, about the product acceptance process. And there was a lot of talk about how involved and how long that takes uh, to run through, and it is an involved process, but it needs to be an involved process because, particularly in the track superstructure, these are safety critical assets, and therefore there must be 100% confidence that whatever goes into that uh, into that asset is uh, safe and does deliver the required performance. So these are lots of TLAs within this piece. DFR, Design for Reliability, uh, is a process now that is embedded into uh, the technical authority uh, for uh, for product proving. Um, CSM and HAZID around the safety aspects of that and of course the RAM assessment um, around integrating all those pieces together. So that full process was followed through um, you know, in, as, a, as a collaboration between uh, SICA as a, as a supplier uh, and the Network Rail TA uh, from Network Rail's point of view. And of course it involves a lot of external testing to existing standards, 
uh, that ISO 12856 is a new ISO to many of you, I'm sure, but that is an ISO standard now for composite uh, railway sleepers or polymeric composite railway sleepers. So there now is an international standard for these types of products that they can be tested against. The ones you're more familiar with perhaps will be 13481 and 13146, which are the standards for fastening systems and the integration of those within the, uh, within the track system. Uh, so those are all, so testing against all of those has been done in addition to the, you know, the over 40 years of in-track performance that composite sleepers and, and cycle composite sleepers have experienced, we've got well over 50 years worth of simulated testing in and around those, um, those test methods as well to give real uh, confidence in not only good performance, but good performance for a very long period of time uh, on that side. Um, outside of uh, the UK, um, the, the product already has um, full approval by Deutsche Bahn uh, after many years of in-track testing and evaluation fully approved in the Swedish Transport Authority uh, for use across a wide range of track uh, asset conditions, but also environmental conditions from the north of Sweden uh, down to the south. Um, and uh, it has full TSI certification and those sort of things to give broader com uh, confidence about interoperability with other components within the track superstructure. Um, so now I can hand over to Polly, because um, the next phase of that was how we then looked at it in the track um, so that Network Rail could kick it and feed it and see how this was going to work in real applications across that range of use. Harbour and Pembroke docks and these sites actually rely almost exclusively on uh, one in three renewals to keep them going, keep them ticking over. So um, I, around uh, the beginning of 2021, the TA were going around, they were holding meetings to introduce the idea of composite sleepers and I kind of got volunteered to go along to represent the RAM team. Um, and it was interesting at that stage because they weren't product approved. Um, they were still going through their full seasonal cycle testing. Um, and at that time, there wasn't really any mention of um, one in three or spot resleepering, um, which, you know, that for us, <laughs> that was a big driver. That was something we needed, um, especially because... Uh, we deliver our one in three sites in a very particular way because we deliver one in three volume by condition, not one in three by design. So it kind of raised a lot of questions and I, I had a lot of email communication with the TA and at the end of it, they decided that they would bring us in as part of that trial process to look at spot resleepering. So our first site was Lambista. And this was delivered in September um, 21. Um, you can see the details of the site on the screen. Uh, we had 272 composite sleepers, and these were supplied pre-chaired for this particular uh, site. And it was an interesting site as well, because not only were we introducing a new product, but we were also introducing a new delivery method because uh, maintenance who were delivering this site had always delivered sleepers manually and they had been asked to start sleep, uh, sleeper changing mechanically for health and safety reasons. So it was going to be a bit of a learning curve for all of us. Um, so to start with, before we even set up the site, when I was out marking up, um, we found something because this is a, bull, a jointed bull head site. So what we had to do, obviously, we needed two uh, sleepers either side of every joint. But as we were going through the site, not all of the existing sleepers were poor quality. So what we were able to do at that stage was to make a decision to save those sleepers um, and set them aside so that they could be cascaded on and used in the site further on, or they could be saved and used at a, a later date. And this was a really important saving for us because the cost of the sleepers, the composite sleepers, compared to the softwood sleepers they were changing, was relatively high. 
um, and we needed to offset that as much as possible. So we delivered the site and it, we, we delivered it. It was far from perfect, it has to be said. Um, the sleeper changing method, yeah, because we'd had the, the sleepers uh, supplied pre-chaired, um, to, the actual, to actually be able to change the sleepers, we were jacking the rail, but also we were uh, dragging the old sleepers out. But um, in sliding the new sleepers in, we were having to disturb so much of the ballast. Um, and it, it just it led to so much manual consolidation. It, it became a really labour-intensive site. Um, and there was something else as well, which we didn't foresee. And then been a bit of a failed um, off track, um, some work going on, and it left the site um, susceptible to flooding. And it actually did flood. It flooded two or three times over that winter, which really, you know, gave a baptism of fire to your sleepers because they were submerged in water for some of the time, but the site as a whole was just saturated and there was runoff from adjacent fields, so there was contamination as well. Um, and they really proved themselves. It did nothing for our track quality, but it really proved what the sleepers were up to. So with lessons learned, we went on to our next site, and this was Landovery. And Landovery was de um, delivered in January 2022. Um, again, the details are on the, on the screen. Uh, 449 composite sleepers, this time supplied drilled only, and there's a good reason for that. So between Lambista and Landovery, I was able to go and visit some sites in different areas to see how they deliver their sleepers. Um, and, and this was with works delivery. And I came back from that and I was able to apply the this, this sort of best practice from those other areas to our area and it improved our delivery method no end. So you can see, whoop, what have I done? <laughs> oh, you know me and IT. <laughs> That's the one. So yeah, you can see on this slide here, it sort of illustrates what that method involves. So we have this uh, blade or a plow to break up the ballast. Um, what happens is we unscrew the existing sleepers, they're sl slid out the side of the track and the new sleepers are slid in. Um, and then at the at the end of a day's work or at the end of the shift, uh, the RRV switches for a tamping bank and we go through and we tamp everything that we've uh, delivered that day. And what this did is it minimized the ballast disturbance um, and with this sort of mechanized consolidation, it actually reduced the amount of manual consolidation and the, uh, the, the sort of manual handling which we were trying to get away from in the first place. Um, the site was then tamped uh, for design and final consolidation on completion as well. Um, and this is actually now the preferred method of sleeper delivery for North Wales, so it was a real success for us. Um, so, looking at other uses. Um, so there, the, the, these sleepers can be used in all sorts of different situations. Uh, this is Sherrington Viaduct. I'm afraid I had nothing to do with this site. Um, and Chepstow Viaduct. But what this does show you is different configurations that you can use these sleepers in. So what you've got here is flat bottom rail on pan 11s with guardrails. Um, and the beauty of these particular composites is that basically, if you could fit it to a timber sleeper, you can fit it to the composite sleeper, so they're completely flexible for our use. And actually, they go up, and up and above and beyond that as well, because there is a fast clip system available too. Um, and the reason they lend themselves so nicely to these kinds of sites is because you've got the 
weight saving of the individual sleepers themselves, you've got a reduction in the amount of, and you've got a reduction in the amount of ballast. So all in all, you do get this weight saving. And on the back of that, we've actually got a site um, on the SHL called Onibri. And this is currently a long bearer uh, system. And uh, it's a complete nightmare for maintenance. And the, the best case scenario would actually be to ballast over the bridge. Um, and be, in the past, it, it, the weight that would have involved was what stopped it from being a possibility. But now, because we've got the lighter sleepers and the reduction in ballast, and we're looking at sort of ballast retention, so restricting the width of the ballast across the bridge, this is now a possibility. And we're carrying out a feasibility study to see if that can go ahead. Um, so t use in tunnels, which I know Jane mentioned, they are product approved for use in tunnels. This, oops, sorry, this is King's Cross redevelopment. Um, and the sleepers, the examples shown here are actually short-ended and chamfered. And this is another aspect of the flexibility of the product in that um, they can be supplied in this format, but they can also be cut and shaped on site if required, as indeed they can be drilled as well. So again, it sort of adds to the, the flexibility of it. We don't currently have any plans to um, uh, use them through tunnels that I know of anyway, not in North Wales. But what we do have is Dimore Tunnel is a full renewal coming up shortly. And although it's a G44 renewal, what we are doing is we're using the short-ended composites around the catch pit locations. So they're proving useful to us in, in all different kind of contexts as well. Um, so moving on. Um, so, so sort of to summarize, really, we've got the increased durability. And I think we actually proved this point more than anyone else that the sleepers are up to these poorer ballast conditions. We've got the long service life. So what we're doing is when we're putting them into somewhere like central Wales, we're improving what's already there. And we're, it means it, we're going to have less maintenance uh, intervention. It, it'll last a lot longer. And things last quite a long time on central Wales as it is, actually. Um, there's no material degradation and uh, reduced manual handling risk because of the, there's no creosote and they're relatively lightweight. They are suitable for spot replacement, which we in Wales, I think we should be quite proud because we went a long way to prove that this was the case. Um, and there's no risks associated with electrical conductivity. Um, and finally, I think I've been through most of these points already. So as already discussed, they can be used for all base plate designs, guardrails. Um, they can be short-ended and chamfered. Better fire performance in tunnels versus hardwood. Um, Prefabricated options are available for faster, lower risk installation. Um, there's a, there is definitely a reduced risk of sleeper damage during handling and transport. We, we know that ourselves, we proved that. And they're also resistant to tamper damage, which unfortunately we also know that as well. So yeah, um, all in all, it's been a really successful trial and we were really proud to be part of it. Over to you. Now, it's pretty clear why Polly was asked by Wales and Western to give this presentation um, uh, on those points. And her passion and the passion of her team uh, in delivering that really brought this, um, brought this to life for her and all the engineers. And, and she's been able to spread that word around Network Rail uh, as well, which has been um, uh, an important part. And I think Darren will attest to that important part of getting the PA done more quickly than has historically perhaps been, uh, been the case. So thank you, Polly. Um, but now I hope that Polly sort of demonstrated that these products work uh, and the anticipate they're for a very long life. It then is possible to look properly at the sustainability aspect of them uh, within the context of network rails, environmental and sustainability strategy. 
which is a very broad and encompassing uh, approach to all aspects of the environment and sustainability. But the track superstructure is a core part of that uh, and how we reduce uh, the embodied carbon in the track. And it's been brought up by both speakers already earlier today. It's not just about the embodied carbon in track on installation. It's the embodied carbon in track through life. Um, and that's the other thing that Andrew Haynes is committed to, to the DFT, uh, beyond the environmental strategy, and that is to pass 2080. And he's committed to the DFT that all projects from 2023 will be subject to uh, 20, uh, past 2080 uh, compliance. And, and past 2080 is whole life uh, embodied carbon within the infrastructure, making decisions around that to align those again with, uh, with whole life uh, value. Um, and so if you're looking at that track superstructure, there are only really four components that you, uh, that, that you look at in there. One of them, of course, is the, you know, the, the, the physical aspect of doing stuff, the plant, the people, the machinery, the logistics, and all that aspect. Uh, and as we heard from, from the Irish Rail example, you know, that's generally about 25% of, um, uh, of, of the project. Uh, the rest is then delivered through ballast, rail, and sleepers. Um, and we'll hear a bit about rail, I think, from British Steel this afternoon uh, on what's happening there. And that is actually, the, that's the biggest single component of embodied carbon in the track. Um, and there is work going on to look at how that can be reduced. It's hard because steel requires a tremendous amount of energy, uh, or rail requires a tremendous amount of energy to create it. So it's a bit of work on, uh, on reducing the energy input, uh, but also there's work on extending life. And if we can have a piece of rail that lasts much longer, going back to the past 2080 and the whole life carbon, less steel is less embodied carbon. Um, ballast, now this is a slightly old um, pie chart uh, here on that and there is some more work done on ballast and actually you know, the ballast component in the track is probably a lot bigger than 5% um, in there. But again, there's not a huge amount that can be done about that because you know, ballast stone is ballast stone and there aren't many choices uh, there for that. But what can be done is extending the life of the ballast. So, so how do we you know, reduce ballast attrition uh, and how do we uh, reduce the maintenance of, of, the, uh, of the ballast as well? So under sleeper pads, everyone's very familiar with and that's there to substantially reduce ballast attrition from concrete sleepers uh, and then there are various other treatments that are being evaluated or additions being evaluated for, for use within the ballast. Um, and then there's sleepers um, and sleepers are a big chunk of, of the carbon in the, um, in the track infrastructure as well um, and they are perhaps the lowest hanging fruit because if we can change the sleeper and deliver a sleeper with lower embodied carbon and we can deliver a sleeper with longer life, uh, we can have an impact on all aspects of embodied carbon uh, through the life of the asset. And just reminding us of the, the amount of carbon that there is within um, the track through the sleepers um, is, is a substantial amount. Um, now, what we've been able to show um, working with Network Rail and working with the principles that underpin past 2080, so the ISO and the EN standards to calculate uh, embodied carbon in the track, um, we're looking at um, a substantial reduction um, uh, with the use of cycle sleeper, and you can see about a third of that of concrete uh, and about a quarter of that of, uh, of hardwood. So that's taking us down to one Land Rover discovery uh, and saving us about 45,000 hamburgers uh, in that piece per kilometer. Um, uh, but we can also look at reducing transport, lighter weight, less transport, you know, 16 less trucks per, per road delivery per kilometer. So again, reducing costs, reducing carbon through that. Reducing ballast, uh, lower profile sleeper, um, about 33% less crib ballast than a concrete track, you know, 400 tons less of that ballast, reducing carbon, uh, reducing cost through that piece uh, as well. Um, but beyond the carbon numbers, there are other aspects that we can think about within that strategy. And it links a bit to the fairy animals sort of point that Jay made earlier on, uh, but perhaps one we're really familiar with. So deforestation in the Amazon. So you know, currently Network Rail sources all of its hardwood sleepers from the Brazilian uh, Amazon rainforest. Um, and it has been historically to meet its demand just for the timber components of that ha has, been, uh, has been calling on Brazil to, to, to chop down about 120 acres of Amazon rainforest every year to meet that requirement. That's about a, uh, you know, it's about 100 football fields worth of, uh, of tropical timber through that period um, uh, to do that. Uh, that's not good um, and that needs to, needs to stop. Um, and you know, the justification for continuing use of hardwood really isn't there, particularly when you know, hardwood sleepers are lasting for 20 years, but it's taken 200 years to so for that tree to grow to the size for, to, to make a railway sleeper. Uh, and composite sleepers, and whether they're the psychic sleepers or the FFU uh, composites, enable uh, network rail to have a different approach and therefore to play their part in reversing deforestation that we have committed to do as a country as part of COP26. 
Um, and then beyond that, you know, plastic recycling. We're equally familiar with the issues around plastic recycling. Uh, the psychic composite sleepers, for example, are made of 100% recycled material, near 100% recycled material, and they're all fully recyclable at the end of their life. Um, and to take those 60,000 hardwood sleepers, or that 120 acres of hardwood forestry, uh, and make those sleepers out of psychic composite um, materials, uh, we're saving about 5,000 tonnes, or using about 5,000 tonnes of UK waste plastic, because we make these in the UK up in Middlesbrough. Uh, that's about 250 million bottles uh, a year on that place. So it's a real impact on us um, as a nation of what we're doing um, to, to, to meet that. We're going some way towards that, and I guess this year we will probably make use, or we'll save about 25 acres or 25 football fields worth of, uh, of the rainforest this year in what we supply there, but Network Rail is still um, taking about 75 acres worth of the rainforest uh, in, into, into track this year, uh, and we'll have saved about 60 million, um, or used 60 million UK waste plastic bottles in the infrastructure, a lot through to the drive that Polly and her team have been doing on that as well. But that consistent demand for that makes a really effective use of um, uh, the waste material, which then incentivizes the infrastructure within the UK to collect, recycle, and reprocess plastic uh, in that way. Um, and I'm rushing through because I've got a, a short warning now. Um, and the circular economy got mentioned um, a, a lot today. That is that left is the circular economy that we work on in the UK uh, at the moment. Uh, the right is the cycle circular economy. And the big difference between those two is that the one at the moment operates in weeks for our shampoo bottle becoming a new shampoo bottle. If we look at the infrastructure, we're looking at a circular economy that works in decades uh, and is completely circular and no loss of material uh, through that uh, in that way. Um, and so now I hand back to Polly to finish up on um, cost. Thank you. So I wanted to highlight this uh, statement from the ORR because I think it's a really important point. Um, and I think the question is, is are we good at putting whole life cost at the forefront of everything we do? And I think the answer to that is it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag. One-off projects, yes, the whole life costing can be introduced and justified at the development stage. Big ticket renewals, yes, to a degree. As long as the business case um, stacks up, it can be factored and budgeted into the control period. But for everything else, not so much. Um, and that, by everything else, I mean maintenance and low ticket renewals like my one in threes. Um, everyone agrees that whole life, um, uh, aiming for the optimum whole life costing is a good thing, but it's got to be supported all the way up. Um, and there is the danger that the minimum viable product is pursued at the detriment of whole life costing. And I think that's a really important point when considering uh, new products such as this one with that increased uh, initial purchase cost. Um, this, so this slide, uh, I won't go through it point by point because we don't have a lot of time, but I think the, uh, this will be available to everyone anyway at the end. Um, but this is basically giving you that breakdown of the comparability between different sleeper materials over their whole life costing. And just to finish completely, so these composite sleepers, um, they tick a lot of big boxes. Um, significantly better performance and longer asset life. Um, improved health and safety, reduced weight and opportunities for prefabrication, does all of those things. Um, Substantial reduction in the whole life carbon associated with maintenance and renewal, which is one of our targets, and a huge reduction in whole life costs. And that's before we've even started looking at the fact that they're made of over 99% recycled material and they are completely recyclable at the end of their use as well. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, that we need to use them. We need to use them more. And that's it from me. So thank you very much.